night because it was like 60 degrees yesterday afternoon, 30 degrees last night. And if you were here yesterday, um, we just praise God for the great foundation that our church is on. And I'm actually not speaking of the spiritual one of Jesus Christ. I thank God for that one, but I'm talking about the one this building is on. The wind was blowing so hard last night um, that the, we had doors being opened by the wind. But uh, we still had a good time last night, uh, enjoyed the concert. Uh, Brother Miles was a blessing, and I'm uh, thankful for everybody that came out last night. But I'm glad you're here this morning. This is the Lord's Day, amen? Amen. amen. Wow, that was really good. Wow, you guys are impressive. All right. Well, let's start off with a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll get right into the service. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your house. Lord, I thank you so much for these that are here, God. I thank you for their faithfulness. Lord, uh, I pray, God, that you would help us, Lord, to each and every one to have the desire to just meet with you today. Lord, I know that it's your desire to meet with us, Lord. You've already done everything that needs to be done so that you could be here, Lord, so that your presence could be not just... Uh, uh, a possibility, but Lord, a, a probability, Lord, if we would just simply focus on you. And I pray, God, that you would help us to do that, Lord. I pray that if there's someone here that does not know Jesus Christ that today, Lord, they would see their need for salvation. And Lord, I pray, God, that those of us that have called on you, Lord, would be drawn closer to you, Lord, and would have a desire, Lord, to uh, Lord, to serve you stronger, to, to uh, allow you to work more in our life, God. Lord, I pray you be with each worship song, Lord, with every special Lord, everything that's done today, God, I pray you be honored and glorified, and I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's all stand. We're going to do an old familiar song this morning, How Great Thou Art. I love this. This is one of my, I know I have a lot of favorite hymns, okay? This is one of them, but it as well is number one, okay? I love it as well, and what a friend we have in Jesus. I think this is a really close third. Uh, I love praising God, and this is a great song. So let's sing out this morning. Do you have a great God this morning? Amen. Then let's sing like we do. Go ahead, Brother Brett. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds I hands have made. The stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul. My Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God, his Son, not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Amen. Good.
good singing. Y'all can be seated. I ask the ushers to please make the offering envelopes available. And then we're going to give our attention to Pastor Burr. He's got quite a few announcements to give to us. Good to be in God's house with you this morning and glad that the wind died down Amen. so we didn't have to blow into church today. Um, last week's offering, not very good, it was $1,433 and we need at least $2,200 to make budget. Uh, we were even down a little bit on our missions giving. Uh, we had $217.15 and we need $250 each week. Uh, for our missionaries. Birthday Sunday is after the PM service next week, so please uh, be here for that. And then on Wednesday, October the 31st, after the service, we will have our love and respect, no trick, and it will be a treat. That's from Pastor, by the way. I told you it was funny, they laughed. Yeah, it was a courtesy laugh. It was not. I just keep laying down the jokes. I'll write them, you say them. Okay. Don't miss a service at God's house on the devil's birthday. Your kids won't miss out on tooth decay. Dress up as Bible characters. No pre-sin Adam and Eve's, please. That means he wants you to wear clothes, not fig leaves. No, pre-sin. Yeah, oh, pre-sin, they didn't even have fig, fig leaves, did they? Yeah. Uh, Yes, bats, wolves, and witches are in the Bible. So there's that. There's princesses in the Bible, too. Yes, there is. So, I think one of the best, my favorite, was when, um, Jane, when the uh, kids were little, James come as uh, King James' version of the Bible, and he had a little Bible suit. That was one of my favorites. That was cute. Um, so anyway, so come celebrate all those things here at church, uh, and uh, we will have, come on, your kids are going to get more candy here than they would going door to door anyway, so uh, come and enjoy that, and we have heat, yeah, and we have heat, that's true, uh, it's all inside, uh, some churches do trunk or treat, but that would be outside, so um, anyway, uh, come and join us for that, then Friday, November the 2nd at 6.30 is our Faith Fall Harvest Party, and that's going to be at Mishana's house. Um, so, um, if you need directions, uh, we have moved recently in the last uh, year, so if you need directions, it's really close to the old house, still close to the Tillmans, uh, just kidding. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, uh, come and have fun, uh, everyone's invited if you're 18 or older, so uh, please come join us for that. Um, Sunday, November the 4th, uh, we will have the Williams family with us. That's Brother Jared and his family. Looking forward to that. And then Sunday, November the 18th, we will have our Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, church will provide the meat. We will have an early service right after we get everything put away. Uh, so if you leave, come back soon because <laughs> uh, we'll be uh, doing that, but don't leave. Stay and have a good fellowship with us and uh, we'll have a good time. And then on Sunday, November the 18th, oh, the same night, is movie night and God's Not Dead 3. So after the Thanksgiving dinner, we'll be watching the, the uh, movie, God's Not Dead 3. So don't miss a service. And if you can't be here, please tune in on our Facebook Live. And uh, if you can't catch it then, then go to our website, faithbaptist.us. Catch up on any services that you miss. Gentlemen, if you'll come forward, we'll receive the offering. All right, Brother Justin, lead us in prayer for the offering, please. Amen. On November the 18th, um, we will have uh, our dinner here on the ground, so y'all bring what you normally bring or whatever you want to bring. Um, the church will provide the chicken. We're going to watch the movie, but then I'm asking for help. Um, after our Thanksgiving meal, and we have the early service on that Sunday every year, then there are a few of us that stick around, and we convert this into a Christmas hall instead of a fellowship hall. So 
Um, we do. We it, it, It's the most decorating that we do all year long. Um, we really put a lot into it, and it takes a lot of work. So anyone that will be willing to stick around and help after that, uh, if, if you start considering that, I would appreciate it. Uh, many hands make light work. So um, we don't want to be here all night, but if it's just me, my wife, and Brother Brent, and I think Miss Sheree, then, well, you, Brother Bob, you've been real good. I'm going to call you out. I like your help, so uh, he's been real good to help. But uh, the more that are here that can help, uh, the more of a blessing it will be so we can all go home uh, Sunday, that Sunday night. So um, also, Brent, could you give me the IFB uh, slide? Um, I forgot to put this in Brother Brent's announcement. That's my fault. Um, not that one. There you go. Um, November 13th is a Tuesday. We're having the preacher's conference here. Um, if you just want to hear some good preaching, I highly encourage you to come. If you, if you, you know, don't have to do anything that day, um, there'd be some good preaching. Uh, uh, Brother Richard Hivner, pastor of the church, uh, Victorious Life Baptist Church in Shelbyville. He'll be preaching. Uh, Brother Alan Ball, pastors, um, Carr Township Baptist Church in Borden, Indiana. And then Dr. Gerald Privet will be bringing the final message. And he's preached here before. You guys are, most of you are familiar with Brother Privet. Um, but uh, it'll be a, a blessing. Any of you that do special music, if you can be here that day, that would be appreciated. And um, we'll just have a good day. And then, uh, you know, we're going to have, we're going to feed the preachers. So uh, we're doing, uh, well, I think Brother Fred's going to make some barbecue for us. And then we're going to have some uh, bratwurst. And, and we're just going to pitch in. So if you can bring something that goes along with those things, that would be greatly appreciated. Okay. And I, Brother Brent, I'm sorry, I forgot to put those in the announcements. All right. I think that's it for the announcements. Why don't everybody go ahead and stand again? We'll do a couple more songs this morning. You know, the Bible says you're not your own, but you're bought with a price. Amen? Oh, my. Well, you don't have to agree with it. It's still true because that's what the Bible says, okay? Um, if you're born again, Jesus Christ paid for your life. And so let's sing this morning. Take my life and let it be, okay? We ought to give our life to God. Amen? Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. <coughs> Move at the impulse of Thy love, at the impulse of Thy love. Take my silver and my gold. Not a might would I withhold. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer. And right now, I'm going to let the junior church kids go. If you're 12 or under, get out of here. Okay, now we're going to sing one more song. Listen, the child of God should never run out of a reason to praise God. We have more than enough reasons, but this is a great song. Now, I encourage you, there's a part in the song where we have instrumental. I don't like to just stand here during instrumental. I feel weird. Okay, so we're going to have a Bible verse, some Bible verses, where this song is taken from on the wall. Read along with me as we read that passage before we get back into the third verse of this song. But let's praise God this morning. Go ahead, Brother Brent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name, sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. 
The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing till the Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name, Your rich in love and Your slow. giveth all thy iniquities, who healeth all thy disease, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things. Amen and amen. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending Ten thousand years and then forevermore Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul Worship His holy
appreciate Brett coming and taking care of the sound booth for me. The Dykes family is all camping. Thank you very much, Miss Sheree. Uh, I know I have her sing that song frequently, but there's a reason. It's because it's awesome. And uh, man alive, I, I need to be reminded myself. Um, we like doing things in our own power and our own might, don't we? We like taking care of things. Listen, I'm, I'm definitely somebody that feels like if I can't do it, it can't be done. I like taking care of business. I like taking care of things and getting things done and, and uh, being the one that accomplishes something. But man, do I get in his way. Man, do we get in his way. If you turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4, and then if you're physically able, would you please stand for the reading of God's word? Hebrews chapter 4. I'll ask you to keep your Bibles handy. We're going to be going line upon line, precept upon precept this morning. Hebrews chapter 4, the Bible says in verse number 9, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord God Almighty, I'm asking you, Lord, to do what only you can. Lord, I'm unworthy. But you are not. Lord, we are here so that you can do something in our lives, Lord. And so, God, I'm asking you to do what only you can do. Lord, to use your word and your spirit to accomplish something in our lives, Lord, that we can never attain to in and of ourselves. Lord, again, if there is someone here that does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, God Almighty, I'm asking you today to move in that heart Lord, to show them their sin. Lord, that their sin has separated them from you, a holy, righteous God. But that, Lord, your works have restored them to you if they'd simply take it on faith. God, I'm asking all this that we might give you the praise and the glory. And in Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you so much. You can be seated. <coughs> Times come and go. There's a season for different things. You know, we're here in a harvest season, uh, headed up on winter, I think, like I was saying earlier, tomorrow. Uh, but um, God does different things in my life and works in different ways at different times. And uh, something that I struggle with, uh, well, uh, let me, uh, I'm going to be, I believe in full transparency, okay? I do not struggle with being lazy, okay? Uh, if I have nothing to do, I have no problem doing nothing, okay? But when I have something that I am supposed to do, I, I want to get it done. I want to get it done. Um, I've only got one point today. I don't have an outline. That's one thing that really bothers me. I like having an outline, Beth. I do. I like having point by point, knowing exactly what I'm going to say and, and stay on point. But like I said, God takes me through different seasons. And I can formulate an outline. I can. I can sit down and I can get out my thesaurus and I can get out my dictionary and I can get out my Strong's Concordance. I can get out my all that stuff and I can formulate an outline. But can I just tell you that that would do none of us any good if God's not in what, what, what he wants to do. If I get in his way. And so I'm just going to try my best today to do what God wants me to do. Because see, I need to learn this lesson that rest is a part of God's plan. It is. Now, we all, at times, need to rest physically. Okay? I, I truly believe that you will run yourself ragged if you do not take a day of rest. 
God gives us Sunday, okay? I don't get to rest on Sunday, but that's okay. I get to rest on different days. God, and I take that opportunity to rest. And physically speaking, child of God, person that is here, you need to take a day of rest. You understand? You will run yourself ragged. You will wear yourself out. You are not doing yourself any favors physically, emotionally, and mentally if you don't take a day off every now and then. As a matter of fact, if you don't take a day off once a week. God gave us the example, did he not? He gave an all-powerful God needed to rest. Are you listening? Why did an all-powerful God need to rest? Was he tired? There's a passage that said that he rested and was refreshed. Maybe he wasn't tired, but he needed to be refreshed. Now, we're going to look at some spiritual reasons why God rested here in a little bit. Because he did it on purpose. He did it for his purpose and on purpose for us. I want you to turn with me, if you would, back to chapter 3 of, of Hebrews. I hope you kept your Bibles open. We're going to lead up to the passage that we've read. I'm going to be as quick as I possibly can. I mean that. I don't want to belabor anything. But we are going to go verse by verse here and look at some things that the author that is trying to get the children of Israel, the Hebrews, to understand the, those that are in the church. Verse 7 says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if you will hear his voice, Harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. Now listen, this author, and many believe Paul, doesn't matter, it's the Lord speaking, amen? This is God's word, is it not? Are you here? Okay, I need you to wake up now, okay? I need a little help this morning. So he says that today, if you'd listen and not harden your heart, it's a day of provocation. So he's talking to them about their history, about something they should understand and know about. The children of Israel, God delivered from great bondage in, in, in Egypt, and he pulled them out, and we talked about this before, with a high hand, and so they came out uh, so that God had a purpose for them. He had something he wanted for them to do. He had a place that he had promised them, did he not? He took them to the uh, land of Jordan, to the land of Canaan, to the land that he had promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. And now 430 years removed from Jacob, here they are on the precipice of where God wants them to be. And God says, I've promised it to you. It's yours. You simply need to go in and take it. But what did they do? They hardened their hearts. The Bible says in the day of provocation. What does that mean? They provoked God that day. They provoked God that day. Now, can I tell you, there are great songs, okay? There are great songs that we sing and that have been sung, talking about crossing over Jordan, going into heaven. They are good songs, but that is not what crossing over Jordan is about. Crossing Jordan is not about heaven, okay? I'm going to be crossing the Crystal River when I get to heaven. That is not the Jordan River. Amen. All right, when I go to heaven, it's going to be a lot better than crossing over Jordan. But now crossing over Jordan is something good if we look at it the way God wants us to look at it. See, God, uh, while we are not Israelites, shows us through the children of Israel that he had something great for them. He had something that he had promised unto them. A life of plenty, a life of well-being, a, a life of, uh, of joy and peace in the land of Canaan. He had those things for them. They simply had to trust him for them. And child of God, I'm telling you today that God has delivered you from bondage. God has promised you a life worth living in him. He has promised us these things and crossing over Jordan is not about going to heaven but it's about going into the abundant Christian life that God has for each and every child of his. So when we look at the children of Israel I want you to contemplate the fact that while we are not crossing Jordan literally we are crossing over into a life that God has promised us a life of victory. I would ask this morning if there's anyone here that likes to lose, but I would be afraid there might be some loser in here that would raise their hand. So I'm not going to ask that question. I, on the other hand, do not like to lose. I have a motto. If I cannot win, I will not play. All right, why? I don't like losing. Why? Losing's for losers. God has promised us victory. Not maybe victory. Not we might could win. Listen, I have on my Chicago Bears tie today, okay? I know I'm not um, in Bears country. I know that, okay? Although I would say since I'm the pastor of the church, this should be Bears country, but I won't go so far as to push that on anyone. But 
I go into each week hoping that the Bears will win. But I'm also a realist. They're playing the Patriots today. They're probably not going to win. Right. But anyways, when Christ promises victory, it's a promise. It's not a, I'll uh, cross my fingers, hope I, I get a victorious life in Christ. No, it's a promise. Verse 9 says, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. You know, God gets tempted. <laughs> Guess what he gets tempted to do? You know, God is long-suffering, but every now and then he gets tempted to knock us out. Amen? They provoked him. They proved him. What did they prove? They proved that if you don't do it God's way, you don't get what you want. Amen? Hey, they left homes in Egypt. Now, not great lives, but they had homes. They had a place to live. They had food. They were, they, they were somewhat taken care of. Yeah, they didn't have a choice. They were in bondage. But they left those things, and God had a better home promise for them. God had something better for them. But what did they do? They decided that they would not trust God. And so what did they have to do? They had to walk in the desert for 40 years. Now, you know what amazes me, Cookie, about them walking in the desert for 40 years? For 40 years, they were still the children of Israel. They were still God's kids. And for 40 years, he never left them and he never forsook them. The Bible even says in one place that their clothes and their shoes lasted for the 40 years. Now, listen. Joseph wants to come up to me every time I wear my boots and say we're twins. Now, I like my boots. They're comfortable. I think they're nice. You, I don't care what you think. Okay? And I, paid, I paid a little bit for them boots. And I would like them to last a couple years. But I do not expect them to last 40 years. I'm not that delusional. We don't make stuff that lasts 40 years anymore, do we? We don't last 40 years. I'm 46 and I'm falling apart. Okay? But the children of Israel walked for 40 years and never missed a meal. And they never had to worry about getting new clothes and new shoes. Why? God has promised to take care of those. And child of God, you can be away from him and he'll still meet your needs. Why? You're his child. You can not be following him at all in your life and he'll still take care of you. Now, he'll still whoop on you like he did for them. They proved him. Listen, they were in the wilderness. You know what a wilderness is? <laughs> it's not comfortable. It's not. It's not comfortable, and it's hot, and it's hard, and it's not exactly what anyone would desire, but this is what they chose when they proved God. They proved, and listen, child of God, if you do not believe what he has promised you, and you choose to do things your way, he will prove himself in your life. Verse 10 says, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, they do all weigh air in their heart, and they have not known my ways. You will never do what you don't know. Right? We fear what? The unknown. We do. We fear the unknown. There's not a person in here that goes racing into the unknown blindly and says, yay. Okay, we don't do that. Why? If we don't know, listen, there might be a cliff there, and I can't fly. I can fall really fast, but I can't fly. We don't know, so we don't go into the unknown. The children of Israel, they only saw with their eyes what was before them. They didn't see what God had for them. And we do the same thing. We look and we see, well... This is a giant, and I'm but a grass. I, I, I'm like a bug. I can't handle it. I'm just a bug to this. I can't do this. I can't live that life that God wants me to live. I can't, I can't do what you do. I can't act that way. I can't be that person. And we start to harden our heart and be filled with unbelief. You know, the Bible says that you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth is Jesus Christ. And let me tell you something. If you'll know him... You'll know his ways, and you'll have no problem going his ways. Verse 11 says, So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you, in any of you, an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. I want you to see something here. God calls unbelief evil. Are you listening? 
Now, <laughs> if you're not, I'm going to say it again because let me just tell you, this hits me where it hurts. When I don't believe God, when I don't believe him in my life, when I don't believe that he'll do this or he can handle this or he's taking care of this, he calls that evil. But I'm a Christian. I'm a pastor. But when I don't believe him, when I have unbelief in my heart, he calls it evil. I don't know about you, that should rock you to your core, child of God. But he goes on. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened to the deceitfulness of sin. You know what hardened their hearts in the day of provocation when the day they provoked God? Unbelief is a sin. That's why it's evil. And we can deceive ourselves into thinking that we're okay. That we're going to get through it. That we can just follow our heart or muster through, muster, muster through, I can't say muster. Muster through. That we'll just go ahead and trudge on. We can deceive ourselves into thinking we can just go on. The Bible says we're to exhort one another daily. Daily. I wonder how many of you would come if we started having church every day. <laughs> Shh, God, quiet. Don't let him think that, Pastor. Pastor, don't think that. But we ought to exhort one another daily. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened to the deceitment of sin. You know, we are to encourage each other. And listen, everybody in here should have a friend that is in here that encourages them. We don't have to have church every day, okay? But we should have someone that encourages us. And you should be encouraging someone else. To do what? To not be deceived by sin. Because let me tell you something. When we're living in sin, when we're letting sin into our life, the sin of unbelief or any sin, what that does is cause us to harden our hearts and not listen to what God says and not want to know his ways. God has something better for us. So the Bible says in verse 14, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Now that doesn't say that you can lose your salvation. It's not what it's saying. But we can let go of our faith, can't we? We can have unbelief creep into our life. The Bible says, though, that we have a reward for faith. Is what it's saying right here. We're partakers of Christ. What does that mean? That means I get him. I have him. And I have all that God has promised him if I simply believe that I have it. Verse 15 says, While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the propagation. And I believe that today God is saying, if you will hear his word, if you will hear what the Spirit is saying, and harden not your heart. You won't provoke God. The Bible says, For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit not all they came out of Egypt by Moses. Now there were two that got to go into the promised land that were there that day, wasn't there? You all know the story. Twelve spies were sent. Ten were back with an evil report. And two were not. Caleb and Joshua. Caleb and Joshua were the only two that had the faith that moved the mountains, that allowed them to get into the land of Canaan that God had promised. Only they believed, and God kept his promise to them. But Verse 17, but with whom was he grieved for 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? There was an entire generation of Israelites that did not get to go to the promised land. And it was that generation that believed the evil report of the ten. It was that generation that did not trust God. Can I say, I don't want to fall by the wayside. I don't want to be one of those that allows my unbelief to fall 
I don't want to be one that God, you know, the Lord's coming back. Amen. Amen. I want him to come back and find me doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And if he doesn't come back before I die, I want to die doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I want to go into glory and not have to hang my head and say, Lord, I just didn't think you were going to take care of it. But there were all that generation, that entire generation that didn't believe God. And God had to prove himself the just judge that he is. And they fell by the wayside in the wilderness. And if these things are grieving you right now, can I tell you, you're grieving God. Verse 18 says, And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. You know, there's different, I don't word this right, there's different areas of unbelief. There's different ways that we can unbelieve. There are those that simply can't trust God in their life and trust him to come to church. And take care of their needs. Or trust them to, uh, to, to tithe and take care of their needs. Or there are those that, uh, that don't trust God to make them look good before men though. There are those that feel like they have to do their own works in order to make sure they look good in the house of God. And maybe even trying to impress God with who they are. Not believing that God can make them look good. There are different areas of unbelief. But all unbelief keeps us from this rest that God has promised us. The Bible says in chapter 4, verse 1, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. We ought to be fearful of being in any type of unbelief. We ought to be fearful of not trusting God wholly in our life. And can I say that, and I say this with, uh, I believe pretty much 100% of surety, there's not one of us in here that trusts God wholly every day. You don't have to say amen. I know. I don't trust God wholly every day. I have unbelief that creeps into my life. Unbelief that he'll uh, give me the right message. Unbelief that uh, uh, he'll see me through this. L listen, I'm praying. I'm begging God by the end of the year to pave our parking lot. I'm begging him to do so. And you don't think that I ask him almost every day, Lord, I believe, but help mine? Unbelief. Unbelief. I know we wrestle with unbelief. I know we wrestle with trusting God in our lives. I know that if I do, that I can't be the only one. I can't be alone in this so we ought to fear the fact that unbelief does creep in. Why? Because God has a promise of rest for us. God has something better promised to us. And if we're not careful, the promise will slip right out of our hands. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith to them that heard it. You can hear all the preaching you want. You can read all the Bible you want. You can hear all the gospel music you want. But if you don't let the faith of God move in your heart, it does no good. For we which have believed do enter into his rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Us entering into this rest, and I know there might be some of you, well, what is this rest? What is, is it a recliner, pastor? Is it a, is it a spiritual rest? I'm going to get to it. What it is that God is trying to get us to see this morning. But this rest that he has for us has always been his plan. It's always been part of his plan. That's why we see him resting from the very foundation of the world. The Bible says in verse 4, For he spake in a certain place on the seventh day and on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it is first preached entered not because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. When the children of Israel that did not 
get to Jordan the first time, those children that came in those 40 years, besides Joshua and Caleb, when they got there again, Joshua said, listen, don't harden your hearts again. Let's trust God. Let's go in. And then verse 8 says, for if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken for another day? Now, I just want to help you with something here, okay? This isn't talking about Jesus Christ, all right? This is Jesus in the New Testament is the same as Joshua in the Old Testament. Yeshua is the word. And it's talking about Joshua. And then we get to our passage. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Now listen, I love resting in the salvation that God has given me. My eternity is set. Your eternity, if you're born again, is set. And we have the promise of heaven. Amen? My goodness, I'm excited about heaven. I'm excited. Brother Miles said yesterday, and I know I've said it before, I'm excited about the day that this old sinner will not think on sin ever again. I'm excited about that day that I have that rest in heaven and glory. And we know that day is coming. We don't just uh, wish for it. We know that it's our hope that we'll be in heaven. It is our promise from God that we have that. But there is another rest that we're being told of here. That is coming, but that is not the rest that's being spoken of. That is not what God is talking about where it says, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. It's talking about different rest. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let's go on. Let us labor therefore to the enter to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Now, I'll be honest with you. This can get a little confusing. So I'm supposed to cease from my works, but labor to enter into the rest? I'm confused. Well, the works that are being talked about are our works of righteousness, our works of well-doing. Our works of evil, our works of unbelief, our works of any kind is what we're supposed to cease from. And we're supposed to labor to enter into the rest. Now, this labor is actually a different word than work, uh, although we do use those, both, those words, right? We, we use them both synonymously, and while they can be, but this particular word is talking about being diligent in pursuit of. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. God wants us to rest. Now, this abundant Christian life, this rest, this is resting from who I am. You know, I talked about being in heaven and not ever thinking on sin again, and that excites me. But if I do things the way God is telling me to do them in his word, if I'll simply cease from my own works, he's promised me rest. Rest from what, though? What am I resting from? From me. You know how hard it was? I've had an entire week to get ready for this morning. Now, I'm just, I'm just sharing something with you guys. I've had an entire week. That's more than enough time to come up with a 5 to 12 point outline. Okay? And, and study. And, and get ready. But you know what that would have been? That would have been my works. And can I just tell you? I tried. But finally God helped me out and said, just relax, I got this. I had no idea what I was going to say this morning, Ms. Norma. Other than just a couple things that God has helped me out throughout the week. Why? He wanted me to just rest in the fact that he was going to take care of this morning. Now listen, it's not, it's not just about, I'm not just talking about preaching. That's, that's, uh, this is my world, okay? I don't know how else to let you guys in. This is, this is my world. This is where I live. But let's look at where you live, okay? God wants you to be someone that is a beacon of light to this world. Someone that they see Christ. But you know what our problem is? We continually try and get in the way. Well, I've got to make sure that I do this. For those of us that are super Christians, because we just know how to be a super Christian, okay, know how to dress right and act right and go to the right places and do the right thing and say the right things, we get wrapped up in those things and it becomes our works. 
And we don't even worry about what God can do or how God's going to work in our life because <laughs> I got this. I've been doing this long enough. I can handle this. And so what do we do? We provoke God. We provoke God. And people see, you know what they see? They don't see his works in my life when I do that. They see my works. And you know what my works are good for, Matt? Absolutely nothing. They will accomplish nothing. They are going to encourage no one. And all they will do is cause people to look at me and go, yeah, I don't want that. I don't want that. No. God wants us. God wants you to learn how to allow his works to show forth in your life. God wants you to be that beacon of light. God wants people to look at you and go, there's something different about them. You know, Brother Brent was talking this morning in Sunday school about when the Lord Jesus Christ spoke. When Jesus spoke, what was he speaking? His word. And his word is perfect. And the Bible says that when he spoke it, he spoke it with power, with authority. He wasn't as one of the scribes or Pharisees. When he spoke, people couldn't help but listen. And can I tell you, I'm a partaker of Christ. You, child of God, are a partaker of Christ. Can I tell you, if we will rest from our works, if we will cease from our works, then God can work in our lives so that when people see us, they'll go, What do they got that I don't have? They have power. They have authority. We're partakers of Christ. Now, can I just tell you, that sounds awesome. But how do I do it? How do I accomplish this? If I'm to labor in this aspect, how do I labor? How do I diligently pursue uh, ceasing from my works and allowing God to work? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. We use this passage so very often to speak of the power of the word of God. But now let's look at it in the context of what we're speaking of today. Because today, God is saying, harden not your hearts in the day of provocation. But I want you to cease from your own works as I did on the seventh day. And I want you to labor to enter into the rest that I have for you. He says, for the word of God is quick. What does that mean? Alive. God's word is alive. This is not just ink on paper. This is not just a leather bound uh, piece of script or a piece of literature. This is God's word. This is alive, a living book. It's quick and not just quick, but the Bible says it is powerful. What's powerful? God's word is powerful. It's not just alive. It has the might to do what we need it to do. And sharper than any two-edged sword. piercing it even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow. You know, God knows exactly who I am. God knows exactly who you are. He knows exactly who you are right where you are. He knows exactly what needs to happen in your life. And he has the surgical scalpel to do the work. When it talks about dividing asunder uh, the, the, the very uh, soul and spirit, the very joint and the marrow. That's talking about getting right down into where you are, who you are, what you are. God's word, it divides those things. Why? Well, there's an old Larry that I've got to cease from the works that he does. And I've got to quit trying to be what he thinks that I should be. But then there's the new creature in Christ, the new man that God has given me, the indwelling spirit of God. And the Bible takes and it divides asunder and says, well, this is the evil. This is the bad. This is the old. This is what should be done away with. And then it divides asunder. This is what's good. This is what's holy. This is what's pure. This is what God has. The discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. What does that mean? There's no one that will get under the light of this word that you will not be revealed. I love when I get a verse that tells me things are wonderful and great. I love those. When I have my devotions and, it, and God gives me something just sweet to eat. I don't love it as much, though, when God takes and he starts to cut away at who I am. It starts to say, yeah, this is something you need to get rid of, Larry. 
Larry, this is not doing you any good in your life. This is evil. Let's get rid of this. Larry, this is pure. You should spend a little time here. Larry, this is good. You should spend some... But that's what he does. Manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open in the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Remember how Adam and Eve hid from his presence because they were naked. And can I tell you, when we start to see our nakedness before a holy, righteous God, our impurity before a holy, righteous God, we're going to want to hide too. We are. We're going to want to hide because we're ashamed. We're going to want to hide. And you know the old adage that sin will keep you from this book. That's what it's talking about. Because we won't want to get rid of them. That's hardening our heart. It's hardening our heart and say, God, I don't want to get rid of that. God, I like that in my life. God, I need that. But all things are open to the eyes of him. Verse 14 says, Seeing then we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. Can I say that today if you have called on Jesus Christ, if you are born again today, if he is your Savior, I want you to listen closely to the rest of this. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the filling of our infirmities. Now I love that part right there. The devil loves to come in to our life and say nobody understands what you're going through. Well, don't talk to them. They're not going to get in. You, you, you're on your own. You're never going to make it through this and nobody's going to understand. So why even bother? Listen, that is unbelief. That is evil. That is sin. Because God says this. We have a high priest that knows exactly what we've gone through. You think you've gone through it? Listen, Jesus Christ went through it way more. He understands better than you even do. And he's given his word to show us that he understands. To show us that there is rest from that type of thinking. But was in all points tempted like as we, yet without sin. He did it right. We can't. We don't. We won't. But he did it right. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I don't know how many of you have a Schofield Bible, but your Schofield Bible right above verse 14 says, the believer is kept in perfect rest by mercy and grace through the Son of God. We find this rest in his mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is me not getting what I deserve. Because see, let me tell you something. I deserve hell. I'm a sinner. I deserve his wrath. I deserve his indignation. But God has given me mercy and there's nothing anybody can do about it. He has mercifully forgiven me wholly that my sins are in the sea of his forgetfulness as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered anymore. That's what my God says about mercy. So when the devil, the old accuser of the brethren, comes and says, you don't deserve what he's done. You don't deserve to rest in what he's done. I can say to him, you listen here, he's taking care of it. And you got no business here. Unbelief be gone. That we may go boldly before the throne of grace. What is grace? Grace is when I get what I don't deserve. I don't deserve his love. I don't deserve his benevolence, his goodness, his kindness, his gentleness. I don't deserve any of these things, his long patience, his suffering with who I am. But he gives me that too. I asked the question earlier, why did an all-powerful God rest from all his works? Can I ask you something? I want you to think about this. Okay, we're going to have a little science class, all right? Since day six, the end of day six, what has been created? Nothing. Every molecule that was made into existence is still in existence. It may not be in the same existence it started out in. There are two laws that are immutable. The first law of thermodynamics that says that all that has been made is made. And the second law of thermodynamics, all that has been made is degenerating. I nutshelled them, okay? But that's the two laws. Nothing has been created since day six. It's all done. And God rested. Why? It was taken care of. And he saw 
that it was good. That's what he said. Jesus Christ, the propitiation for my sins, the substitutionary death for who I am, came and lived a sinless life. Never once did he cross God in any way, shape, or form. He simply did God's will his entire life. Lived unto God and unto others, serving the entire time. And took that sinless servant's life and laid it down on the cross. And as he was on the cross, he said, he said a few things, but he said three words that really ought to matter to the child of God. It is finished. What? All the works that needed to be done so that I could rest were done that day. And no works that have been done since that day will ever accomplish anything of any merit. Why did God rest? For our example. For our example. Can I just tell you today that God wants you to quit being who you are. But that's just the way that I was raised. Or that's all I know to be. And, and God has said, okay, if you don't know what other way to be, then let's get into God's word, which is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And then... It's not just about me reading this Bible. I need to read this Bible. Amen. I need for God to speak to me. But then when he speaks to me and he starts to show me the things that are wrong in my life and I start to see the struggle, what do I do? Well, I get to go boldly before the throne of grace and enter into the presence of my God. And I can say, God, I'm struggling with this. God, I don't know how to go on with this. And I can give him my unbelief and he can give me the faith that I need to rest. Because all the works of righteousness that have ever been done were completed by Jesus Christ. And there's no righteousness that I can do. There's no holiness that I can attain to. There's nothing that I can do that will accomplish anything but angering God. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed if you'll stand with me. I'm done. The invitation song is going to play. And I just want to encourage you today to come talk to your high priest, the one who understands, the one who gets it. Don't harden your hearts. Trust him with your life. Quit trying to be good enough and accept what he did as good enough.